Meeting is actually on custom service. That was fast. Um, okay. All right. Um, okay, so um, we are starting chapter two um, of the book of Proverbs. Uh, the first chapter gave us a brief introduction into um, King Solomon's world, the idea of having the humility necessary to um, find wisdom, the ideas of you know being persistent, clarifying our desire to want to connect to the infinite, um, giving us as much as many pearls of wisdom and encouragement not to give up to find those truths. So over here to, to this week, we're gonna, we're gonna try to do the first nine verses. Also very, very deep. So he starts like this. Is, if my child, if you accept my words uh, my, and my treasures and my commandments, okay, you do this, to make your ears attentive, um, um, attentive to wisdom, um, incline your heart to understanding. If only you call out to understanding and give forth your voice, so that you could actually find discernment from your voice. So what's he saying over here? Let's go back for a second. He says, so he says in the beginning over here, now, he says, bini, im. So the Chachamim say over here, this is specifically Rashi, that the word im means en, right? That means my mother. That if you want to go ahead and you want to find um, wisdom, right? If you're looking for uh, this power that informs you, that infuses you with the understanding of everything that the world has to offer, you have to be willing to um, think of it in this unique way, which is what? Number one is that it's your mother, right? What's your mother? What, is, what does it mean that your, your, your mother, your mother is something that is connected to you? What, how do we relate to mothers? Well, number one is our mothers are the source of everything for us. They represent the power of making sure that all of our wants, all of our needs are being met, okay? Um, so what is uh, Shalom Elch saying? He's saying that if you, my words are conditional. If you want to understand them and accept my words, you have to be willing to go ahead and accept them like a mother's word, as a mother's words, of the same way that a mother would go ahead and provide everything for her child. You have to be willing to go ahead and push yourself beyond so you could find these truths. And then he says, titzpon itach. You got to treasure my commandments with yourself. So now, what does that mean over here? So the word amarai, my words, refers to Torah study, right? Which we have a, a mitzvah to do all the time. The mitzvah of Torah, the limuda Torah happens at any moment, right? There's no one time that's been the other time. We know we put on your tefillin in the morning, that's shachrit. Certain blessings are recited at certain times of the year. But Talmud Torah, the learning of Torah, that could happen at any time, day or night. But our verse over here says the word tikach, right? So accept, if you accept this duty constantly, Right? If you go ahead and you think of the pursuit of wisdom and knowledge, not like matzah at the Seder, right? there's like a specific time, and if you lose that time, it's lost. But if you see this as a treasure that you could always perform, right, and you treasure these moments, when that good deed is performed, you will have an, an, um, an amazing opportunity of connecting to the infinite. So how, does that, how do you do that? So he says like this, he says, to make your ear attentive to wisdom. How do you make your ear attentive to wisdom? What does that mean, King Solomon? How do you do that? So Rashid tells us that if you engross yourself in the study of Torah, you're, you're able to go ahead and attune your ears to that sound of the study of Torah. So what is chokhmah? Chokhmah refers to the knowledge that's gained from a teacher. Okay, ase oznecha kesparechet. Make your ear like a mill hopper, a large, like a, a funnel through which your grain is channeled to the mill. If you open up your ear and say, I'm going to be someone who's always looking for knowledge and wisdom, you will find knowledge and wisdom. Then the Pasuk says, Tate libechle tfuna, 
incline your heart to understanding. So what does that mean? If you make a strong effort to understand everything that God wants, right? Your reward, punishment, whatever it is, right? But he, he, God's not interested in uh, doing bad for us. He only cares about our effort. It doesn't matter if you're going to be punished or reward. That's not why we're, that's why we, that's not why we do things or don't do things. We do what is right simply because we are trying to do what is right. Let me explain. Most people think that Judaism is so difficult. It's so hard that, you know, I'm just not going to bother trying. Why should I try to do anything? It's just too much. I can't, I'm not going to be the guy that's waking up at, you know, sunrise and going to the mikvah and fasting and praying all day. That's just not who I am. And that's fine. Okay, tateli becha tuna means you got to incline your heart to understanding. What efforts are you putting in to comprehend truth, right? What are you doing to create a desire to find truth, right? It all depends on your efforts. And I, I'm telling all of you this. You could quote me, this you could quote me on. I don't like being quoted, but if you're going to quote me on something, quote me on the idea that. It doesn't matter if you do everything in Judaism. What matters is that you're trying your best to do what you can do. That's all that matters. It's not all or nothing. That God, you think God is sitting there with a measuring stick? Oh, you see this? You didn't do all these things. You're going to get punished. He's not doing that. God wants to know that you're putting in your efforts from where you are at. What's your vantage point? Where are you sitting right now? What are the circumstances that got you to where you are? You think he cares you're doing everything the way it's supposed to be written out and so on and so forth? There's no diagram that says how to do this stuff. But each of us know what we should be doing and could be doing. And that's what he's saying over here. He says, Incline your heart to understanding. Put your efforts into understanding these truths and see yourself flourish and grow in your ability to understand and relate to God. Now, Rabbi Yona says the next few verses... Um, contain the five steps that are necessary to require chokhmah. It's worth it just to come to hear these five things. We'll do these five things tonight and we'll call it a night. So what does he say? He says the five steps in to, to get chokhmah, to get wisdom, is step number one. This is all based on uh, Shlomo HaMelech. Number one, you got to listen carefully. Number two, you got you to gotta concentrate to the exclusion of all else. All else. Get yourself to a place where you could be focused on one thing and one thing alone. If you're thinking about all things later in the, in the, in the Mishle, Shlomo Melech says, Ene ksil haaretz, the eyes of the fool are at the ends of the earth. What does that mean? If you, are, if you can't focus on that one thing that's right there in front of you, and because you're, you're always looking beyond what's in front of you, all you are seeing is everything else. You're missing out on opportunities right here and right now. And therefore, what, what Shlomo Melech is telling us is that if you want to find wisdom, forget about everything outside. The outside part is important. You got to have a vision. But if you want wisdom, number one, you got to listen carefully. Number two, you got to be con concentrating to the exclusion of everything else. Focus on one thing and one thing alone. All of us have had experiences when we prepare where we lock ourselves in our rooms, shut our phones down, and just focus on one thing and nothing else. And we should be doing this at least once a day if you want to find wisdom. Number three is you got to pray and ask God to help you have the sechut, the merit of finding chokmah. Okay, it's, that's also powerful. The, to be a mivakesh, what does that mean? We often relate to praying, I say this all the time, like a magic genie. I go to God and say, God, please, you know, I could really use an extra $100,000. I got fundraising to do. Please, God, I really love Porsches. I really want a Porsche. I want to be able to get to Minyan on time. You know? <laughs> and, um, you know, my kids know I like Porsches and they know that I like, um, they know that I like Teslas. So my, my kid, my daughter asked me, you know, um, we were in the car and I saw a Porsche. I'm like, oh, I really like that Porsche. So um, my daughter asked me, which would you want more, a Porsche or a Tesla? I'm like, I want both. I want the Porsche so I could go to shul on time. And I want the Tesla to go to work on time, right? So like, what do you need a Porsche to go to shul on time? I'm like, you don't, but like, I just want to make sure that I get there on time. And if people see that you can go to shul and drive a Porsche and it's normal and not crazy. So, um, so the, the reality is, is that we are living in a time where um, you got to pray. And praying doesn't mean that I'm asking or making a wish for something. Praying means 
that I have a vision in my mind of where I want to be. And I'm asking God for the help, the clarity, so I could achieve what I want. Remember, and two weeks ago, we read the parsha when, when uh, Abraham was promised that he was going to be the father of a major nation and he's going to inherit the land of Israel. How did the parsha end? Parsha Chaye Sarah ended with Abraham not having, uh, having a son, one son who wasn't married and having nowhere to bury his wife. Where is God's promises? So what does Abraham do? Abraham recognizes that in order for the promises to come true, he has to put in his efforts. Can you imagine that? He had no place to bury his own wife. God promised him. So what is he? has got to buy the piece of land. In a land that was promised him by God, who owns the land, he's got to go ahead and spend a fortune to go ahead and get a, find a place to bury his, his wife. For his son, he's got to go ahead and he's got to send his trusty servant, Eliezer, to go out and find a shidduch for him. Right? There's no promises. Promises mean that if you put in your efforts, your reality will become true. You want to make your dreams come true, you got to fight to make them come true. They're not going to happen by sitting there and, you know, praying and, you know, cutting your, people do crazy things. You know, someone today said to me, Rabbi, I need a mezuzah in my house. Can you come and put a mezuzah in my house? My wife's expecting, I want to make sure everything goes well. I'm like, okay, great. I'm happy to come. She's like, do you, I married them. She's like, you know, my wife saved broken glass from the chuppah. I'm like, really, Why? She said that if you sprinkle that into the mezuzot, you're going to have a good shalom vibe. I'm like, listen, I mean, like, if you want to sprinkle broken glass into your mezuzot, that's fine. I mean, like, I think it's weird. You don't need to do that. Whatever's in the scroll is good enough, but I, I don't have an objection of sprinkling broken glass in your mezuzah. So uh, man, people have all these weird ideas. Like, you, you don't need that stuff. It's, it's, the mezuzah is simple. Praying is simple. There are words that are there to help us meditate to create a space where we could clarify who we want to be. And then we have to go out and become those people. You want to find wisdom? Are you praying for it? Or I'll say it a little differently. You know, um, when I made the decision that I want to go and study in Israel, um, a brilliant rabbi said to me, you know, do you really want to go to Israel? And I said, I really want to, but my parents aren't letting me go. They're like, you can't go. I was 18 at the time. Um, they're like, you can't go. So um, he says to me, did you, did you cry? Did you, did, you, did you do what you did when you were a kid? I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, when a child wants something, a child cries for it. Why is he crying? Why does a child cry when he wants something? Because in a child's mind, when you really want something, you got to give something. Child, this is intuitively. We've been, we've been trained not to cry when we want something. We've been trained to say, okay, I don't have it. It's okay. But who says that's the right response? Maybe the response is when we want something, we should be crying for it. Maybe the response is when we truly want something, we got to fight to make it happen. Who says I just give in and give up? And that's been my attitude in life. Like, I don't give in and give up for anything. And when I want something, I don't stop until I get it. Until God says, no, I'm going to keep trying to get whatever it is that I want. I'm not going to rest until I get all the things that I want. And, and whatever I have is all a blessing from God, but I believe, believe that as much as you know, that, that blessing was able to, to come to fruition because of my constantly asking and asking and praying and pushing and so on and so forth. Don't wait around for things to happen. You know, I say to people, don't let life happen. You have to make life happen, right? And I think that's what praying is. Praying is not about making things happen. Another example of this is when um, uh, Moses was standing at the sea and he had 2.5 million Jews who were just freed from their bondage, from their slavery, leaving Egypt, standing at the beach, nowhere to go, seeing the Egyptian army behind them. And they're freaking out. And they're saying, Moses, what are we doing? Did you bring us out here to die? And Moses says, I don't know. I'm going to start. He starts praying. Right? So you imagine the scene. He's standing there on the top of a rock. They're all looking towards him. And he's reaching out to God. Please, God, I need your help. And what does God say to him? Why are you praying to me now? Why are you praying now, Moses? Now's not a time for prayer. Now's a time for action. So he's like, actually, what do you mean? One guy named Nachshon, Nachshon ben Aminadav, gets up and he says, you know what? If God brought us here and there's water in front of us, that means we have to cross through the water. So what does he do? He jumps into the water and keeps walking. And he walks and he walks and he walks and he walks. And what happens? He gets to the, uh, the water gets to his neck and he keeps walking. As the water reaches his mouth, that's when the water splits. In the Israeli army, there's a, they, they use that, his name, Nachshon. It's called a Nachshoni. That when you run into battle, 
and you have like complete faith that whatever you're doing is going to work out for yourself, right? Ariel Sharon, the uh, former prime minister of Israel, also a war hero, that's how he took over like the Sinai Peninsula. He, 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 what he did was a nachshon. He just literally ran into the battlefield, and he, he the, 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 uh, the enemy, the Egyptians were not ready for any like, Oh, must be if he's pushing this hard, this fast, he must have a tremendous amount of cavalry behind him. He didn't, and he just took the element of surprise. He was one guy, and he fought off like fifty tanks, you know. But it was that that nachshoni move came from the faith that everything that's going to happen is going to work out in his favor, right? That's what I believe prayer is meant to do. Prayer is meant to be a system that allows us to um, a visualize, articulate who we want to be, where we want to go, and then more importantly, having the faith that it'll happen, just like Abraham promises, um, that just like God promises Abraham that he's going to have the land and his uh, son will be a, uh, the heir to his legacy and a, and a great nation. He had to make it a reality for himself. It gives us the courage to recognize that we're not alone, that God's there with us, but we have to do it for ourselves. The sea would not split unless we got up and got wet and dirty. Okay, so the fourth, um, the third step is to pray. So number one is listening carefully. Number two is concentrating to the exclusion of all else. Number three is praying to merit the chokhmah. You got to pray to get the, the chokhmah, the wisdom. Number four, expending effort in its pursuit. Okay, that means if you're not putting in effort, you're not trying hard. If you're not schwitzing, you're not sweating, you are not going to find what you want. And the way I say this, and I, the way I say it, I say it all the time again, hashtag no pressure, no diamond. If you are not in stress, if you are not working hard, if you are not struggling, there's no mud and dirt in your hands, there's no sweat by your brows, you're not going to get a diamond. The world that God created for us is a world where we're, we, when we overcome our struggles, our circumstances are there for us to over overcome. And when we overcome them, that's how we become great. That's how we find our strength. That's where our superpower is. It's seeing the obstacle and not being, not crying. Oh, it's too hard. I can't do it. No, stop being a baby. See the circumstances as, as an opportunity for growth. And they see how they say in the army, they say pain is weakness leaving the body. <laughs> Got that? Pain is weakness leaving the body. That is the way we view the challenges that we have in our own lives. So number four is putting in the effort for the pursuit of uh, your wisdom. Number five is to love Chokhmah. So let's see those ideas inside right now. Okay, so we're in chapter two. We're going to start with verse number three. So he says, Im kakesev kitmononim tikbasena. Right? If you um, if you request, if you long for um, understanding, and if you search for it, if you seek it like silver, right, and you search for it as a hidden treasure, as tavin yirat Hashem, only then will you understand the fear of God, the dat elokim, and the and the uh, knowledge of God. Timsa will you find ki Hashem yitin chokma because God grants wisdom mipiv datuna from His mouth come knowledge and understanding. Okay, so okay, let's let's break that down a little bit. So He says im tevakshen kakesev. Now, if you seek, if you seek wisdom as if it were silver, right? So that is the fourth step. So you have over here like this. you're on a beach and um you know you were told that there's gold coins in a certain area right because you have a map treasure map that was given to you by a uh, your your grandpa who said like, i buried some some gold coins there and this is where you got to find it so you get the map out it makes sense you go down there you drive down to you know brian beach and uh, you got a little find this little stone you lift it up and you start digging and digging and digging and you can't find it now do you just walk away no must be nearby so what do you do? You keep digging and you don't stop until you unearth every single possible rock in the area until you find that money, okay? If you pursue wisdom, if you seek wisdom as if it were silver, right? If you seek wisdom, chokhmah, just as a person who is able to pull the ore that is underground, Right, which requires a tremendous amount of effort 
of mining to recover it, that effort will eventually yield forth wisdom, which is worth far more than any gold coin or silver coin you could possibly find, right? If you search for it as if it were a hidden treasure, right? If you don't lust for wisdom, if you don't have that crazy gold, you know, like a rush mentality, right? That's like so many who came to this country, you know, looking for wealth and power, right? If you don't toil, if you don't work hard to find this stuff, you're, you're, you're not going to find wisdom. And remember, most people think that it's about, well, well, what's the wisdom, right? How do I get there? How do I get to a place where I actually want to have this wisdom, right? And the answer is first get to a point where you're just looking for it, right? Rabbi, I want to understand Judaism. I want to understand God. Okay, well, well, what are you doing to find God? What are you doing to understand Torah? What are you doing to understand all the things that make Judaism so uniquely special? Well, if you're doing nothing, then don't be surprised if uh, you don't have any really positive results. But Rabbi, I keep pushing and I just haven't found it yet. I don't feel a connection. Don't give up. Never give up. I get this specifically. We you know I get this a lot with Shabbat and Tefillah and prayer. Rabbi, I don't connect to my prayers. I don't connect to the Sabbath. What should I do? So I say to them, well, what have you been doing right now? I go to synagogue and, you know, I open the sitter and I don't connect. I'm like, well, what else do you do? Nothing else. Okay, so, well, and you've been doing this for how long? For two years and nothing's changed. So why are you doing the same thing over and over again? I don't know. I don't know what else to do. You see, someone who has an intuition that Judaism is true, someone who has a, uh, a gut feeling that Judaism is nice, but doesn't sweat, doesn't work hard to connect to it, will always be an outsider. We, I know Jews that are outsiders to their own religion. Why? Because Judaism is demanding. It wants you to think intellectually. It wants you to grow spiritually. It doesn't want you to be stagnant. It doesn't want you to be the same person, but it's so easy to be comfortable. It's so easy just to be as, let things be as is. Yeah, but you're not gonna connect that way. By the way, in a relationship, okay? Those of you that are in relationships and those of you that have families, if you want your relationships to work, you gotta always be putting effort. What works this year won't work next year. What works uh, you know, last year and the year before may not work tomorrow. You always have to be putting in effort to make things great. Nothing that is valuable works without continuous effort on our parts. That's what it means to be alive. When we read the Torah and we read that this person lived, why did the Torah God tell me this person lived? Obviously he lived, he's mentioned in the Torah, right? And I think the difference between um, being alive versus living is that in Judaism to be living means fighting to have an amazing life. It means overcoming struggle. That's what life is measured by. Life is not measured by flat line when things are straight and easy and calm. What is a beating heart? A beating heart is constantly going up and down. It's fluctuating, it's moving, it's never staying still. It's always moving. And that's exactly what King Solomon is saying. If you want to find wisdom, if you want to understand this stuff in its depth, in its greatness, in its full glory, then you have to be willing to fight to feel a connection. You want Shabbat to be real? You know how long I had to fight to connect to Shabbat? But I love Shabbat now. I, I, I'm in love with it. I, I, don't, I hate to do Havdalah. I don't want it to end. I love it because I love being in that space. But I fought so hard to build that relationship. I love my wife very dearly. But it, it wasn't like, oh, it wasn't like Disney said, you know, they live happily ever after the wedding. It's a lie. It doesn't work. <laughs> You know, it was a constant fight nonstop for 23 years, but a loving fight that always led us to a place where we were able to have a deeper understanding of each other because we respected each other. We worked hard to get to where we are. My kids, I love my kids, but it's not easy being a dad. As a matter of fact, sometimes I want to go on vacation and I don't want to be a dad anymore. I don't want to hear their problems. I don't want to deal with their issues, but I love them to pieces because they represent my future. They represent the world for tomorrow. And therefore I work hard and I fight through my own 
personal, uh, I call them my inner demons, you know, that want to pull me away versus my desire to go ahead and uh, want to see them succeed. I fight. You got to fight for those things. But you want to have great kids? I have great kids. Izzy has great kids, right? And Izzy will tell you that uh, it wasn't easy to have great kids and that it was a lot of praying on his part, a lot of praying on my part, and a lot of fighting and a lot of uncomfortable conversations. And it's not easy. And I want you to know, Izzy, it's not going to be easy in five years from now either. <laughs> you know, it's going to be it's going to be hard, but we're in it for the long run, right? We we want to go ahead and invest because being alive means investing ourselves in the things that we do, right? And this is exactly King Solomon. This is this 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 advice is coming from the guy who's the most intelligent man on earth, okay, that ever lived. He is the epitome of chokhmah of wisdom, and he's saying, guys, that if you want to go ahead and find wisdom, you have to search for it as if kitmonanim techpasena. Search for it as if it were hidden treasures, right? You got to enjoy that quest. You got to enjoy that pursuit for wisdom and knowledge. You got to toil in it. You got to work hard. You got to be thinking, like, I, if I'm not shoveling, if I'm not schwitzing, if I'm not sweating, if I'm not <coughs> fighting, <coughs> excuse me, to make this thing amazing, <coughs> then I am in trouble. Because that means I'm not really working hard. That means I'm not, I'm not really valuing the things that I'm doing. Anything in life that is worth having, you got to fight for. Anything that comes easy for us, we don't value. I have a friend who has a, he has a school, a beauty school. And, um, you know, he's been doing this for like 30 years and he closed all of his old schools and he realized that, you know what, in order to make your school successful, the way to do it, is you got to charge five times more than everybody else. So like, let's say a normal school costs like $1,000 for six months, he charges 5,000. Why? Because, and he, and he was getting, he was getting more people applying to school at five times the price because they believed they were getting a better product because why else would it be so expensive? He must know something that no one else knows, right? And so what was he really, what was he really doing? He wasn't manipulating. The people that were coming to his program because they had to spend so much money were working harder. Because five thousand dollars is not a lot. Of, it's not. It's a lot of money just to give up to somebody. But because these people invested more into the program, they were getting a better education. Not because the teachers were better. It's because the people were like, "I'm putting in so much money. I got to get. I got to get the, money, the value out of it. Where's the value?" So it was coming from them. It was like reverse psychology. It was brilliant. How are we hacking into our own brains? to inspire ourselves to find wisdom. Okay, so number one is, so we just said King, <coughs> King Psalms is five things, right? You gotta be a careful listener. You gotta concentrate, the exclusion of all else. You gotta pray for it. You gotta put in tremendous effort. You gotta love it. Okay, great. Now, how do I do that, Rabbi? How do I do those five things? So number one is, you gotta meditate on it. Well, how do you do that? Very simple. I want you to take out a piece of paper and say, I want to find wisdom. I want to connect the to Torah. I want whatever I want in your spiritual uh, journey and write it out what you want to do. And then ask yourself, how am I going to get there? There's the real, the reality you're in right now. There's the ideal, the ideal vision of where you want to be. And then there's something called the process. Okay. And that, that process is expending in all the efforts. Well, how do you do that? What's the process here? Well, number one, uh, once you have the idea, the real, the ideal, the process is looking for an answer. If you're not bothered by the question, if you're not bothered by, well, how do I get this? How do I solve this? You've already failed. Writing the question and not looking for the answer, you might as well just sit, keep, keep sitting on the couch. Don't, don't bother getting up. You're okay. I'll get you a beer. You know, just keep doing what you're doing. You're not going anywhere anyway. But if you are looking for wisdom, if you are looking for truth, you got to be willing to go far to get it. How many mentors have you called to help clarify how to find wisdom? How many wise men have you sought after or wise women have you sought after to find wisdom? How many books, how many libraries have you gone to? How many Google searches have you looked for finding wisdom, finding Torah, finding how, 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 much, of, how much effort have you put in? Because you put in zero effort, you're not going anywhere. I'll end with the following idea. The Talmud says like this, how do we, there's a, there's a, it says that people get rewarded for learning Torah, for going to, uh, if you go to a class, you go, those of you that came tonight, you all got major brownie points with God tonight, okay? You, you went to the class, you put in some effort, you're here, 
and you're learning. Okay, great. So where is the uh, merit for the class? Is it coming to the class? Is it listening to the ideas? Is it sharing the ideas? Where does that wisdom come from? Well, where, where, is that, where does that merit come from? So the Talmud says that the merit for coming to a class comes from not understanding the class. It comes from putting the effort in going to the class, right? So if you came to a class and you literally rolled out of bed and it was across the street and you literally rolled into the class, you get very little reward over there. But if you tried really hard to go to the class because it was really far, but that class is your class that you need to go to because you need to push yourself. And that, that rabbi there, he's, the, he's gonna yell at you for being late and he's gonna demand excellence from you. He's a person that knows who you are and he's gonna push you. You get merit not for understanding the class because anyone, everyone's understanding is different but you get the effort for, for getting up and going to the class. You, 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 the effort you got today was from clicking on the link to open up in this class, very small amount of effort. But this is the world that we're living in today. We live in a world where there is no effort. I gave this example uh, yesterday. You know, I was talking to a bunch of uh, dads on Sunday morning. We have a father and son program. We miss you, Izzy, uh, in, in Manhattan, but when we were doing the deal, same thing's happening here right now. And so I told the dads, you know, we live in a world where, you know, there's zero effort. We don't challenge our kids anymore. Our kids don't, everything is made for them. They have a maid, a food, they don't do anything today. Um, you know, I remember when I started like uh, lighting Hanukkah candles back in the day, if you want to use oil, you had to go out and there was no oil. You had to find the right oil. There was no, no one was selling pre Hanukkah oil stuff. You want to make wicks, you have to go find wicks. I had to get, I had to take con balls and like take them and twist them into little things and make my own wicks. And then there was no, none of those like little floaty things to make sure the wicks stay in place. I used to take like, I used to take bobby pins and like break them in half and use them and like twist them over to the glass. There was, and now you go to the store, you buy a little like oil jar that has a break off top, you know, and you throw it in and the wicks in there and it's super easy. You got to do nothing. And I, and I, I was telling, you know, I was telling the guys, if anyone wants to make a lot of money, all you got to do is do like an AI powered like Hanukkah. <laughs> All you gotta say is, hey, Siri, hey, Alexa, or Google, whatever it is, light my Hanukkah, right? And then you'll just have like some robot hand coming in and lighting. It, you do nothing today. And the more we remove ourselves from the process, the more disconnected we are from our spiritual growth. The more involved we are in the process, the more involved we are in the spiritual growth. You wanna teach your kids had to feel a connection to Shabbat. You want a connection to Shabbat. What are you doing to make it great? What efforts are you putting in to make those experiences meaningful? Because if you're not putting in the effort, you ain't connecting. You're not sweating, you're not tearing, you're not gonna find the wisdom. So what does is, what is, what is King Solomon say? He says, if you want to find this wisdom, if you're really looking for this connection to God, you got you to you put in the effort. If you're not putting in the effort, you're not going to find it. Ki Hashem yitin chachma. Where does wisdom come from? From God. That means <clears throat> even if you put in all your efforts, Rabbi, I study the Talmud. I don't, I don't understand it. That's not up to you. That's up to God. You think God cares if you know the material or not? He's interested in your heart. He's interested in the effort. What you know is irrelevant. What matters is the effort you put into the subject matter. Tell my kids, I don't care what grades you get on your tests. I want to know that you studied hard. I don't care how well you did. Somehow they all got good grades, but like, but I, I, I'm more interested in the effort that they're putting in. I don't care about the grades. And they know that I don't care about the grades. And I think that is a lesson we need to carry with ourselves. What are we doing to motivate ourselves to find greatness in wisdom? How are we looking for this dot and tuna? What are we doing to connect to this understanding and discovering this deep rooted knowledge of God and, and, and wisdom that God grants to us. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding, not from ours. We have to just put in our efforts and God willing, live with whatever understanding and blessings that we have. Thank you so much for listening. God willing, next Monday night, please join me same place, same time um, for Mishle, uh, finding ancient wisdom in modern times. Great night, everyone. Thank you for listening again. Thank you, Rabbi. Bye. Good Pleasure. night. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye